Welcome to this episode of The People Dividend. I'm Mike Horn, and I am absolutely delighted to have in our virtual studio today, Dr. Richard Safir. And uh, he's an incredible talent, and he's got a great book out uh, called A Cure for the Common Company. And uh, we're going to explore uh, what's inside the book uh, as we uh, move through today's episode. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about uh, 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 Richard Safir, and that's MD as in uh, uh, that kind of doctor. Uh, so for the past 20 years, uh, he has been a pioneer in workplace health and a thought leader. Uh, Rich has assessed cultures, trained leaders, and conducted and explored research on the intersection of individual and organization behavior. And uh, for all of the listeners of the podcast, uh, you'll know I love intersections. So this one is particularly fascinating uh, around individual and organization behavior. Let's say a l- little bit about what Rich does uh, today, and that is... Um, serving as the Chief Medical Director of Employee Health and Wellbeing for the Johns Hopkins Medicine, where he leads the Healthy Hopkins Employee Health and Wellbeing Strategy. He is a regular conference speaker on the topic of building a culture of health and well-being, and he's published numerous journal articles on this topic. Dr. Safir teaches in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He also taught the inaugural graduate course, Organizational Health, at American University. Previously, he was medical director of the Preventive Medical Medicine for Care First at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Baltimore, Maryland. He has been credited with bringing wellness into the responsibilities of the managed care industry and led Care First BCBS uh, to be among the first cohort of health plans accredited for wellness by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. This is quite an impressive uh, record and Let's just say before uh, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, Dr. Safir was the medical director of occupational health of the Occupational Health Center in Baltimore and wellness director for the Mid Atlantic region of the center's parent company, Concentra Medical Centers. Previously on the faculty of George Washington University, where he was the residency director of the Family Medicine Training Program, and uh, he began his career practicing family medicine in Northern Virginia. Uh, Rich completed his bachelor's degrees in nutritional biochemistry at Cornell University before he graduated from medical school at the State University of New York at Buffalo, completing a residency in family medicine at Franklin Square Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, For those of you who are listening carefully, you will notice this uh, 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 East Coast pattern here, Northern Virginia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, he completed a faculty development fellowship at fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, certified in clinical lipidology by the National Lipid Association. Previously served on the board of directors for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, fellow of the American Academy of Family Medicine, the American College of Lifestyle, and the American College of Preventive Medicine. He serves on the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, Catalyst Insight Council. Uh, Rich, I'm absolutely, um, I, again, both thrilled and delighted to have you in uh, the People Dividend virtual studio today. So, look, I've said a lot about you already, but why, why don't you s- tell our audience about yourself? Well, well that, that was very kind of you to read all that, Mike. I mean, at the end of the day, I still put on my pants one leg at a time. Um, I I'm married, uh, three kids and a dog and a minivan in suburbia. So I'm, I'm pretty, re- I think I'm relatable to others. I've got my own well-being challenges too. So, uh, I, I am amongst, uh, my, my peers here. What does it mean to have, uh, well-being challenges? What does that mean? Well, you reminded me <laughs> while you were reading my, uh, my bio that there's a reason why I'm tired a lot. <laughs> um, I, I actually am fortunate to, to be in a place in my career where I, I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit and uh, I am paying more attention to, to my sleep. But Mike, that is one area of my well-being where I've had to work on and be very conscious about improving. So uh, that, that's just a, a glimpse into my own challenges. It's always nice to know that the MDs are human as well. So I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. 
How, how do you go from family medicine, Rich, into this uh, journey that uh, mm -hmm. takes you into employee health and well-being? Yeah, it's certainly not a journey I ever thought I was about to embark on and, and never right. imagined I'd land where I am today. Mike, when I was in college and studying nutrition, I really had um, like many moments of being surprised that we didn't learn this earlier in our life. There were so many moments that I, I recognized what a loss our communities have by not teaching our kids the importance of nutrition at a young age, because that's when our habits are established. And it wasn't until I was in family medicine that I recognized, boy, all of these patients or most of these patients that are coming to see me for their chronic diseases really wouldn't need a doctor had they learned healthier habits growing up. And so it, it caused me to scratch my head to figure out what might be a better path. The second thing I observed during my first two years of practice was that while I was going from one room to another every 15 minutes, which clearly was not enough time to help my patients with the root of their medical conditions, my patients were also looking a little bit hurried. They were either rushing into the office from work or they were going mm. back to work. And it just recognized like, hey, 15 minutes with me is not enough. And these folks are spending almost 2,000 hours a year in the workplace. And Mike, that's when I realized I needed to make a transition. It wasn't a straight transition. You mentioned the several jobs I, I had in between. Uh, but it was the next job going forward that I started to learn about the art and science of employee health and well-being, which ultimately took me to my role at Johns Hopkins Medicine. It's so interesting, uh, you know, having had uh, parts of my career and to certain clients who work in biopharma and uh, biotech, I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, lots of different uh, uh, MDs, MD, PhDs, uh, people who have pursued uh, different uh, areas of medicine. Uh, gastroenterologists always cracked me up because it seemed that the uh, younger men and women in the field really were big video game players. They uh, <laughs> learned their scoping skills that way. Uh, and uh, one of my colleagues uh, who I supported, a uh, rheumatologist, talked about uh, – you know, having a long-term relationship with patients and uh, using that as a choice point for pursuing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, his uh, work in that area. What was it, you know, you talked about the 15-minute intervals, uh, Rich. What was it that, uh, again, sort of ha had you make the leap before, yeah. uh, from family medicine into this uh, topic? What was the the motivation, the drive? Well, I think it was, um, I was being pushed and pulled. Um, uh, first, I was being pushed. I was being pushed to my limit. When I finished my training, um, HMOs were in their peak. And, and Mike, seeing patients every 15 minutes was not um, good for my patients and not good for me. Uh, I was physically exhausted. I was emotionally exhausted. I mean, one thing I didn't, hadn't realized when I was becoming a doctor is how much I would internalize the pain and mm -hmm. suffering of my patients. So I was physically tired. I was emotionally tired, and I, and I didn't feel like I was making a difference. At the time, Mike, there was no discussion about burnout. And uh, although it was back in 1997, 98, I probably was burned out. So there was the push, pushing me away from family medicine. But the, the pull was this huge opportunity to make an impact in a, in a non-traditional forum. Um, this idea that, you know, all of us are working most of the time. And there's got to be a way to leverage our jobs in our workplace to support our health and well-being. So interesting. Uh, you know, we'll talk about nutrition and uh, about you know, healthy living uh, mm -hmm. as we before we explore a cure for the uh, common company. 
But one of the things that I often keep in the back of my uh, mind, I was hiking Pasto in California, and one of the folks who was uh, part of our hiking team, our trio, uh, uh, was an oncologist. And he said that, you know, one of the most difficult things in delivering uh, cancer news to a patient uh, was listening to their responses. And they would start by telling him, well, you know, I'm going to change this habit and that habit. I'm going to start, you know, drinking green tea or, uh, you know, making lots of dietary choices. And uh, what he conveyed uh, at that point, which always stuck with me you know, these 20 years, was that uh, the time to do that was earlier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was yeah. at some earlier point a, a, as opposed to a, a diagnostic point. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, given your background, I mean, er, early on as a nutritional chemist and coming from that uh, world. Well, first, I just want to make sure I heard you say that you hiked Half Dome in uh, yes. Yosemite. All right. Yes. So count me in the next time. OK, okay. <laughs> you got, you've got yeah. my attention. Um, so uh, what I the example that you just gave, I believe the late Dr. James Prochaska would say was a um, a response that brought someone out of pre-contemplation change or the pre-contemplation stage of change into a preparation or 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 you know getting a plan together and and it's very um difficult for that to occur occur but one way for that to occur is by having an emotional response and in this case it's a diagnosis and unfortunately that is often the way people begin to change their patterns um certainly not ideal i would agree with uh your colleague that you know maybe if we could do that at a younger age that's fine but any time is better than no time and you know it's it's not easy creating new habits or getting rid of unhealthy habits but when we have the support of the people we work with and when we have the support of the employer and the workplace is designed to support a healthier day and healthier emotions, then it makes it much more likely for us to achieve these new healthy habits. Uh, it's so much about environment, right? Uh, uh, behavior is really a function of the person and environment to think about yeah. uh, Kurt Lewin. Yeah. And- you know, yeah, we, we think that it's our own responsibility to live a healthier life. And yet, sure, we, we can be responsible for ourselves, but we also have to recognize that most of us don't live on an island. We mm-hmm. live with people in our home and we live with people in the workplace. And it's really the collection of, of those forces that shape our ability to make healthier choices and have healthier emotions. Mike, one of my uh, catchphrases is that well-being is a team sport because we really can't win alone. Well, so true. Uh, so true to all of that. Um, look, I want to talk about a cure for the common company, uh, Rich Saphir, and mm-hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a prescription, as the subtitle suggests, for uh, a happier, healthy, and more resilient uh, workforce. And I want to let everyone in our audience know before they go and pick up this book that some of my favorite people uh, have uh, praised this book. Uh, uh, the CEO of Great Place to Work. Uh, many people in the audience will know that uh, I led uh, for about six or seven years the Great Place to Work campaigns. And for one organization that has, I think, been on the list for maybe 20 years in the top 10 or top 15 of companies, uh, also, uh, Marshall Goldsmith. Uh, I was just uh, honored earlier in the uh, this week by as being named as one of the twelve most influ- influential executive coaches in California. I was lucky to be on that list with Marshall and some other people. Uh, so it's always good to see that. Dan Pink, uh, Chuck Gillespie, CEO of the National Wellness Institute, Institute, and others. Um, but why why did you write a cure for the common company? Well, one of the benefits of uh, not being fulfilled in my first job as a family physician is that I got to learn so many different aspects of healthcare in my travel to this position today. And so, 
not only have I been a practicing physician, but I've also uh, been a teacher and I've been able to run an occupational health program. I worked in an insurance company and got to see the, uh, the healthcare environment from that angle. And all of these different angles, Mike, have led me to conclude that most employers are not taking a comprehensive approach to supporting the health and well-being of their workforce and that they needed help. And first of all, most leaders never get trained on how to support the health and well-being of their workforce. It's not a typical course in the MBA curriculum, or it's, and it has not been traditionally part of human resource training up until a couple of years ago. So there's this huge gap of knowledge. And having been doing this for so long, I, I kind of felt like I had something to share. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to put it into words. Well, it, I mean, it gives you a set of unique qualifications, uh, Rich, if you're a physician, teacher, manager, leader, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, a, a unique perspective on this uh, arena. One of the things that I found interesting uh, in reading some of the uh, press for Cure for the Common Company was that less than 3% of Americans are sufficiently active, eat a healthy diet, maintain a healthy weight, and abstain from smoking. Less than 3%? All of really? those, all of those healthy habits. Yes, yes, it's really wow. shocking. I mean, more than three percent are active and and do their exercise. But when you ask people to 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 achieve all of those, then we re- really narrow down the numbers. It is shocking. Um. So, you know, what's what's the what what's missing uh, in in people reaching uh, their health goals? Um, you know, to borrow on your catchphrase, I mean, about well-being, being a team sport, knowing that uh, our our systems of managing and leading people don't account necessarily for, well, I don't know, I wouldn't say necessarily don't account yeah. in great margin for right. employee health and well-being. I mean, what 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 makes this uh, a potent thing? I mean, the, these numbers make it potent. What makes it actionable for? Uh, everyone in our listening audience, the HR leaders, the HR professionals. Right. Uh, right. What, what, what makes this action uh, potent, potently actionable? <laughs> I, I think most HR leaders recognize that the health and well-being of their workforce is important. And most managers probably realize it's important also. But collectively, not only were these um, influencers trained or given the skills to do so, that they don't even have a roadmap to, to move forward. So the book provides a framework for human resources to follow to intentionally create the culture within the workplace that's conducive to supporting health and well-being. I mean, the, the dry, there are many business drivers such as improved retention, increased ability to recruit talent, decreased presenteeism, increased productivity, decreased disability claims. I mean, the list goes on and on, all, all these wonderful things. But at the end of the day, uh, the folks on the front line, the managers, the human resource professionals, we need guidance. And, and that's uh, why I, I think it's uh, this book can help. It seems that um, so much of the focus uh, lately in the well-being area has been around mental health and mental well-being. And uh, as an employee in organizations, I also noticed that, you know, I mean, a person lucky, luckily enough to be insured by, by companies that provide uh, outstanding health care, uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of talk about, well, improve your diet, improve your get moving. Then uh, how do we make that connect with people? Yeah. Um Mental health is is a challenge, um, and, and so is eating well and moving uh, appropriately. But I think most people know that they should make healthier food choices and know they should move more. We don't need more campaigns to eat apples. What we really need is to to decrease the barriers to being able to get to those apples. And so 
I, I would ask organizations who are expecting their employees to live a healthier life, what are you doing to make it easier for them during their waking hours? Because they spend most of their waking hours with you in the workplace. So what are some of the things that uh, HR leaders and other executives and organizations can do in this regard, Rich? Yes, this is a, this this question could consume the rest of the day, Mike. Of course. But of I'm course. gonna let me go back to let me go back to mental health. You mentioned mental health is a big problem. It is a big problem. It's not going to go away anytime soon for a number of reasons. But we can make it better, and we can probably stem the tide of mental health problems that are brewing currently. And we can be um, proactive in the workplace. Many Americans say that their job and their manager is the number one stressor uh, in their life. And so most managers probably don't even realize that. UKG did a study uh, about a year and a half ago. They surveyed about 2,600 English-speaking employees in four countries. And they they found out that uh, just as many people who said their spouse impacts their mental health also said their manager impacts their mental health. That's how powerful we are as leaders. And I don't think most leaders are trying to be a negative uh, force in the their team's life, but they don't recognize it. And then they aren't helped. We don't help them understand what they can do to be a more positive force. And Mike, that's just scratching the surface. I always tell the uh, leaders and managers and teams that I work with that the most talked about person over a meal yeah. or dinner is yeah. the manager. Yes. You know, it's such a critical component. And, yeah. So, uh, I wonder I like if to, managers took that to heart. I mean, what, what uh-huh. kinds of behavioral changes right. we might see. I like to remind managers that they probably don't want to be the source of somebody else's insomnia because mm. managers have had insomnia because of their own boss. Um, the, uh, there are a, a number of ways leaders can support the mental health of those they lead. And Mike, I'm sure that many of your previous guests have have come through and shared some of those um, skills, uh, compassion, listening, not micromanaging. We We know the repertoire, the ability for the leader to embrace that and practice that it varies based on uh, their experience and their recognition as to whether or not it's important. But there are some uh, roles that leaders can play that are often under-recognized. The role of the leader is a role model for practicing well-being uh, during the workday. When our leaders engage in well-being practices during the workday, it's uh, an implicit permission to those they lead to do the same. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that if the leader organizes a team meeting or event around well-being, it's going one step further, saying this is so important that we're going to make special time together on the agenda. It normalizes the process, and it gives support throughout the team so that once the program or skill or whatever it is is over, You've all gone through the same thing now. Now you can turn to your coworker and and ask to continue with them because you were introduced to this skill together. So so being a role model. Mike, another one that I don't think most leaders recognize is that they ought to be thinking about how they can remove barriers to well-being throughout the day. So we all have our barriers to well-being. Maybe it's the copy machine has been jammed for six months and you're tired of cleaning the paper out so that it can run again. You know, your boss may realize it's a problem, but may not realize that it's been going on for six months and how it's really at, you know, causing you to be at your last uh, last wit. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause there. There's there's more ideas in the book and leadership engagement is only one aspect of how the workplace can work for instead of against the employee's health and well-being. It's interesting. I, I love these concepts about being a role model. It's certainly uh, powerful in uh, organizational settings. Also like the idea of removing barriers. 
I think at times, too, uh, about creating barriers. I'll just go back to your coffee example. Uh, I once saw a CEO uh, who consumed way too much espresso uh, blow up uh, when his espresso machine wasn't working. <laughs> and, and what he seemed really upset about, he said, in a matter of moments, there are going to be 10 people here trying to fix uh, the machine. Uh. And, and it was interesting to watch... Uh, you know, this series of stress produced for 10 people yes. over a yes. very short period of time. Right. Uh, and, and how I thought about that. And I also think I want to talk with you, Rich, a little bit about where time uh, comes into this. I, one of my clients, uh, chief scientific officer of a big biopharma company. And uh, I think one of the things I always observed about this individual was there never seemed to be enough. Uh, hours in the day in order for him to read papers, make progress, mm -hmm. attend mm -hmm. to executive committee meetings. And I was lucky enough to see him uh, just about two months ago and he came riding up on his bicycle. He has since retired. <laughs> I saw, uh, you know, a whole different, but where's time factor into this for busy executives? Yeah. Time is a, a commodity that most people wish they had more of, and I, I do talk about work-life balance, and I talk about the importance of priorities and setting boundaries, uh, and that when we are healthy and well, uh, it makes it easier for our teams to be healthy and well, and when we're all healthy and well collectively, we work more efficiently, and we're more likely to be successful. I think, you know, many leaders are still trying to get past this uh, myth that more is better when, in fact, we just need to be uh, using our time more successfully, more productively. And having a clear head is an essential part of that uh, process to, to get to success. Boy, so true. And, um, you know, as I understand, uh, your book, uh, A Cure for the Common Company, uh, a well-being prescription for a uh, happier, healthier, and more resilient uh, workforce. I mean, you're really one of the first authors. I mean, in this uh, uh, to create a a step-by-step a, a, a step, uh, guide, a roadmap for a well-being culture that integrates science with practical solutions. Uh, and you've done that by case studies by Feeling where this is happening. Um, what makes the condition successful for HR leaders and for others to begin to promote this? Uh, other than, you know, the crisis, though, the CEO has right. a heart attack, we'll jump right. on his bandwagon for right, right, right. Uh, six months. Well, Mike, I'd say that every organization is unique and every organization has to find the opportunity for how to introduce possibilities. I don't think there's any uh, company that is exempt from having the ability to make a difference on this front. Now, someone listening might say, hey, there's no way this is going to happen because our CEO and our president has already determined that this is not a priority. But that doesn't mean that you can't find the handful of managers who know how important this is and to work to help them so that they can succeed because it's possible for there to be pockets of success within an organization. And once that success is learned, other teams are going to want to copy their process. You know, we, we, we see this in certainly business success. The same thing can happen when it comes to health and well-being success. And Mike, many leaders, once they learn that there's success happening within their organization, they want to be associated with it, right? Because everybody wants to be a winner, even if it uh, means that we're jumping on to the coattails of people who are, you know, at lower organizational levels than the president. So um, there's all kinds of excuses not to start, but there's so many ways to start. And I guess the benefits are tremendous to an organization. You know, I, I'm sure there are some in the audience uh, who might think, well, this is just going to cost more money, more time, more ah, effort. But I, yeah. I would think also that you start to think about lowering 
uh, overall the overall healthcare burden uh, yeah. to organizations. Well, Mike, you, you, another reason why I wrote this is because too many organizations have a reflex to pay for an app or a wellness vendor. I'm not opposed to either. Uh, in fact, I use uh, more than one app for my own well-being. And in fact, Johns Hopkins Medicine has a contract with the wellness vendor. But what I'm asking organizations to embrace are things that are essentially free. And, and that is how we set up our cafeterias so the healthier foods are easier to reach. Uh, maybe even put a green sticker on those healthier foods so that it's easy for our employees to know which ones are going to lower their blood pressure because not everyone remembers how to read a food label. I'm not opposed to trying to teach people how to read a food label, but hey, just make it easy. Boy, and that really brings in your whole concept about uh, this being a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about certain cooperative behaviors that you would think that many employers would want to embrace uh, because it makes an employee productive for a longer period of time. Absolutely. I mean, as a human resource professional, there are so many ways to show your value. Uh, and, and all of them can be shown through improved employee health and well-being. Not to mention that we're all humans and we all, I, I'm pretty sure that 99% of your listeners, Mike, are seeking greater health and well-being through the workday. Uh, and in fact, in each of the building block chapters of the book, I turn the concept around and provide a call out box. It's called put your own mask on first to help the reader recognize how this building block can serve their own health and well-being. And Rich, uh, in the, you know, as we begin to wrap up, though, I, I'm curious about what's your sense of the progress we're making? How are we doing? Are we moving towards more? Uh, is that 3% number, which is just so shocking? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, it, are we going to turn a corner on that? Well, uh, I, I don't know about turning the corner on those, on that number in particular, Mike, but there are some trends that I'm encouraged by. You know, one thing that I'm encouraged by, greater acceptance of Eastern medicine, like yoga and like mindfulness. Mike, I don't know if you can think back to the 90s. Uh, I don't know what you were doing, but I know that part of the 90s for me was watching the Chicago Bulls uh, be a successful basketball team. What I did not know at that time, but not until in a decade or so later, was that Phil Jackson, their coach at the time, introduced mindfulness and that the players learned the skill, which contributed to their ability to focus and get the ball in the basket. Now, fast forward to 2024, Mindfulness is much more common across the United States. It is not taboo. People don't think you're you know, weird if you do it. And that's a huge difference over three decades. So that's great. The other trend that I'm seeing is that more and more companies are recognizing that well-being is more than a program portal and prize, that it can't just be limited to the items that can be checked. It is more about the relationships. It is more about the stress level. It is more about the workflow that's contributing to our either good health or not so good health. That I don't think is going to fall backward. I think we're in a good place going forward. That's great. And I, I do want to let all of our uh, listeners know that they can find a cure for the common company at all of the places where uh, we buy books. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Hudson, Porchlight, Bookshop, IndieBound, Book Depository, Wiley, the publisher of this book. Lots of places where you can uh, access uh, this book, A Cure for the Common Company. Rich, just as a, as a last question, uh, Dr. Sphere, if we were, if, you know, every, um, I'm always fascinated by a particular change model that says you've got to have dissatisfaction. You've got to have a sense of dissatisfaction in order to create some, some change. Plus, you've got to have some uh, vision. 
uh, some idealized uh, state it doesn't have to be big and fancy, but you got to have some way that you think about uh, yourself or your team or your organization differently. All of that has to be uh, greater than resistance to change, but it also begins with taking some first steps. Mm -hmm. So if you were thinking about these first steps in a cure for the common company, what would you tell our listeners are uh, in the audience about, you know, where, where, where some of these first steps might be? You pointed out some great stuff around role modeling and reducing things, but, you know, for everyday HR leader out here, where, where do they start? Where are some of the places? Mike, I could answer this a lot of different ways. So I'll just give you a few different directions. I mean, one, you, you need to make well-being a priority. You need to carve out time each day or each week where you're processing and creating the strategy that you want to see come to life. If it's not a priority, it won't get done. If it is a priority, not only will it get done, but every other objective and goal that you're trying to achieve will be easier when you are healthier and more well and your team is healthier and more well. So that's one idea. A second idea is to literally put well-being on the team agenda. Most leaders have uh, regular team meetings, whether it's once a week or once a month. Put well-being on the agenda. And that way, you have a standing agenda item. And prior to and during preparation, you're thinking about what is it that I'm going to address this week or this month with my team. And finally, Mike, I'd say that people either need to read my book or get educated in some manner about organizational change when it comes to well-being. Okay, so many leaders know about organizational change when they're trying to either reorganize or build a new product or go into a new market. But we need to understand that if we're truly going to optimize the well-being of our workforce, we need to look at this not only as an individual challenge, but an organizational challenge, which will require organizational change. Wow, so it's such a great way to think about it. And uh, Rich Safir, if people wanted to learn more about you, uh, where would they visit or where would they go? And we'll put this all be in the show notes. So. Well, great. Uh, RichardSafir.com. Um, Mike's promised to put the spelling of my name in the uh, show notes, so that should be easy to type into your browser. I'm also active on LinkedIn. I pretty much only post uh, on the topic of employee health and well-being. And I'm also um, offering a, a more intensive online experience through creating a wellbeingculture.com. Uh, it's so great. Uh, and, and all of that will be in the show notes, but it's uh, wonderful to uh, be in conversation with you, Dr. Sphere. Uh, uh, thank you for humanizing this topic. Thanks for taking all of that big academic and medical experience and talking about your role as a, as a dad, father of three. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, working through these roles as physician and teacher and uh, leader, I uh, appreciate all the work that good work that you're uh, doing in the world. So, if you wanted to leave our, our listeners with one last thought, what would it be on this topic? I wish each of you uh, much success on your health and well-being journey. Be patient. Some of our habits took decades to create, and trying to unwind them could take a more more than a couple of weeks. Great. Well, again, uh, so great to be in conversation with uh, Dr. Richard Safir, uh, author of A Cure for the Com uh, A Cure for the Common Company, which is a well-being prescription for a happier, healthier, and more resilient uh, workforce, published by Wiley. So, until the next episode of the People Dividend, stay well. Mm -hmm.